elsewhere. He went on with his plan. Sir, I wish to know you. Provisional smile on the face of Brent, puzzled. Hello, Argon. You seem upset. I wish to make your acquaintance. But my dear Argon, what's the matter with you? We already are very well acquainted. I am not Argon. No? The good-natured, smug certitude offended him. This man would never see anyone but Argon he knew. Yet he on his side saw a man, directly beneath his friend, imprisoned with intolerable need of recognition. Argon that the baffling requirements of society had made impugned a parasite of his solitude, had foregathered too long with men, and borne his name too variously to be superseded. He was not sure if they had been separated surgically, in which self life would have gone out and in which remained. This man has been masquerading as men. He repudiated Argo nevertheless. If eyes of his friends up till then could not be opened, he would sweep them, along with Argo, into rubbish heap. Argo was under a dishonouring pact with all of them. He repudiated it and him. So, I am Argo. Of course, but if you don't. That is I! Your foolish grin proves you are lying. Good day! Walking on, he knew his friend was himself. He had divested himself of something. The other steps followed, timidly and deliberately, odious invitation. The sound of the footsteps gradually sent him to sleep. Next, a cafe. He alone writing the table. He became slowly aware of his friend seated at the other end of the room, watching him. As it had actually happened before his return to his uncle's house. There he was behaving as a complete stranger with a set of men he had been on good terms with two days before. He's gone mad. Leave them alone. They advised each other. As an idiot, too, he had come home, dropped idle and sullen on his relative's shoulders. Suddenly, through confused struggles and vague successions of scenes, a new state of mind asserted itself. A riddle has been solved. What could this be? He was Argon once more. Was that a key to something? He was simply Argon. I am Argon. He repeated his name like a sinister worm invented to launch a new soap. In gigantic advertisement, toilet necessity, he, to stroke the soul. He adventured in his solitude and failed. Argon, he had imagined, had left in the city. Suddenly he had discovered Argon who had followed him, in hand. And, um, as, um, as, as, as uh, what happens next is um, this astonishing description of Snore, um, and his shivering in the corner, um, feeling violated at having been defeated in battle by, by Argyll. And um, Argyll is sweeping the corner and starts to snore, and it has to be the most astonishing description of Snore. It's just the, you know, and you know, it's I don't, know, I don't know, it's just me speaking, but I engage with it. You know, like when you hear someone snoring like that, and you want to sleep. It's, just, it's, it's incredibly, and it's just repulsive. The physicality of the snore at that point in time is astonishing. And uh, this is what happens to Ham, and uh, he snaps and um, decides that Argo must die because of the snore. And um, I, I think this is kind of this giant with something that I find fascinating in the moments, um, which is just this intense um, repulsion. Uh, with regards to the body and the physical body. Um, as I've said, um, what you get staged in the universe is this dichotomy, this battle um, between body and mind, um, which will produce the synthesis that is the artist. And um, the horrible thing um, for the Muslim period is that body well, seems to be winning. Um, you have the triumph of empiricist psychology, um, you have his friend James Joyce, um, who in Ulysses seems, seems to have set up a similar kind of battle between more body and mind. Um, this is how the Muslim reads it. You see Stephen Douglas as being a uh, representative of the mind, the ideal, and uh, uh, Leopold Bloom as being the embodiment of the body. And um, he's horrified that by many Ulysses, Leopold Bloom wins. He just he, he, he steals every scene. And uh, he's absolutely horrified at his, his appeals to Ulysses as a travesty. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's a step back. He fears that the synthesis that might result may, it may not be the synthesis he desires, it may not be the um, the, the, the ideal artist as giant, as art, the, ideal art, uh, the ideal giant as artist, it may be the ideal giant as crowd um, that we're approaching. Um, this is what's going to happen in the future. And so this fear and this, this hatred of the physical is, is there all through Lewis. And um, this is what you get, and I think very, uh, kind of, uh, very, very vividly in the closing uh, scenes of the play, which I'm about right now. Suddenly, Lewis was struggles and 
waste and processions of seas. A new state of mind asserted itself. Flung back to extremity of hut, hand laid for some time recovering. Then brought chapel for rest of mankind. Arbor had brutalized him. Both eyes were swollen and pulp. Shut in. Brought for him hardly possible, so cut off from the visible world. Sullen indignation at Arbor acting. He who had not the right to act. Violence in him was indecent. Again, a question of taste. Blue bottle, at first unnoticed, hurtling about. A snore rose quietly on the air. Drawn out, clumsy, self-centered. It pressed inflexibly on Hamp's nerve of hatred, sending hysteria gyrating at top of diaphragm, flooding neck. It beckoned filthy, ogling finger. The first organ note abated. A second at once was set up, stronger, startling, full of loathsome unconsciousness. It purred a little now, quick and labial, then virile and strident again. It rose and fell at the centre of listener's body, and along swollen nerves, peachy, clotted tide, gurgling back in slimy shallows, snoring of a malodorous, bloody sink, empty as water. More acutely, it plunged into his soul with bestial regularity, intolerable mismatching. Aching with disgust and fury, he lay dully, head against ground. At each fresh offence, the veins puffed faintly in his temples. All the sonority of the voice that subdued him sometimes suddenly turned bestial in answer to his vision. How can I stand it? How can I stand it? His whole being was laid bare, battened on by this noise. His strength was drawn raspingly out of him. In a minute he would be a flabby, yelling wreck. Like a sleek shadow passing down his face, the rigour of his discomfort changed. The sly, vaulted facts of nature. Billy settled thickly on him. A snore crowed with increased loudness, glad seemingly of him, laughing nothing that he should have at, least, at last learned to appreciate it. A rare proper world if you understand it. He got up, held by this foul sound of sleep, in dream of action. Wrapped beyond all reflection, he would, martyr, relieve the world of this sound, cut out this noise like a cancer. He swayed and groaned a little, peeping through patches of tumefied flesh. Boozer collected his senses, fumbled in pocket. His knife was not there. He stood still wiping blood off his face. Then he stepped across shed to where fight, fight had occurred. The snore grew again. Its sonorous recoveries had amazing and startling strength. Every time it rose, he gasped, pressing back a clap of laughter. With his eyes, it was like looking through goggles. He peered round carefully and found a knife and two coppers where they had slipped out of his pocket, a foot away from Arbor. He opened the knife, and an ocean of movements poured into his body. He stretched and strained like a toy wound up. He took deep breaths, his eyes almost closed. He opened one roughly with two fingers, the knife held stiffly at arm's length. He could hardly help plunging it in himself, the nearest flesh to him. He now saw Arbor clearly, knelt down beside him. A long, stout snore drove his hand back. But the next instant the hand rushed in, and the knife sliced heavily the impious meat. The blood burst out after the knife. Arbel rose as though on a spring, his eyes glaring down from Ham, and with an action of the head as though he were about to sneeze, Ham shrank back on his haunches. He overbalanced and fell on his back. He scrambled up, and Arbel lay now in the position in which he had been sleeping. There was something incredible in the dead figure, the blood sinking down, a moist shaft into the ground. Hamp felt friendly towards it. There was only flesh there, and all our flesh is the same. Something distant, terrible, and eccentric, laving and failing in that milky snow, had been struck and banished from matter. Hamp wiped his hands on a rug, and rubbed it in place for a few minutes, then went out of the hut. The night was suddenly absurdly peaceful, trying richly to please him with gracious movements of trees and gay processions of arctic clouds, relief of grateful universe.
A rapid despair settled down on Hammond. A galloping blackness had moved. He moved quickly to outstrip it, perhaps. Near the gate of the yard, he found an idle figure. It was his master. He ground his teeth almost in this man's face, with an aggressive and furious movement towards him. The face looked shy and pleased, but civil, like a mysterious domestic. Hamp walked slowly along the canal to a low stone bridge. His face was wet with tears, his heart beating weakly. A boat slowed down. A sickly flood of moonlight beat miserably on him. Cutting empty shadow, he could hardly drag along. He sprang from the bridge clumsily, too unhappy for instinctive science, and sank like lead, his heart a sagging weight of stagnant hatred. And uh, a big hand for all our speakers at this point. We will be uh, reconvening at one o'clock when the festival proper starts. Yeah.